Hi everyone, welcome to our Certified Financial Planner course preview. In this preview, we are going to cover what is a Certified Financial Planner, what it means to be a Certified Financial Planner, and finally, why you should consider doing the Certified Financial Planner program with Financial Perspectives. Okay, um, this webinar will take about half an hour, but it may stretch longer. But anyway, if you need to go earlier, you can just log off the webinar, and then later on, you can always come back to um, view the recorded versions. All right? So let me give you an introduction about myself. Okay, my name is Ronald. I'm currently the Director of Financial Perspectives. Uh, I bought over this company last year in September. Okay, uh, I'm also in the business of managing other people's money problems. Okay, I run a company called Clarity Privy, where it's a family office that specializes in managing the wealth of ultra high net worth people from overseas. Okay, I also run an insurance agency, Ronald Wong Consultancy Services. Okay, at the same time, I'm in also other businesses as well. Okay, so anyway, as a financial planner, my job is to help my clients increase their net worth and we use many ways to increase their net worth things like cash flow management you know uh, managing their assets and so on so we help them do it by increasing their assets okay finding ways to do it like i mentioned earlier and decreasing their liabilities and as a financial planner we always help our clients turn their dreams into reality okay so my name is ronald r o n a l d Alright, so don't forget me. Anyway, you'll get to know me more eventually in other um, webinar sessions. And even if you attend my class, you will know me better. Alright? Let me use retirement as a context in explaining to you why financial planning is important. There are many other reasons as well, but I just want to um, keep my seminar to a very short um, duration. Right, as we all know, in Singapore, we have two main issues. Singaporeans are generally underprepared for retirement. And secondly, Singaporeans are generally underinsured. Of course, there are many other uh, problems that we face. But uh, in terms of retirement, these are the issues we see very commonly appearing. All right, firstly, we are living longer. In today's context, a Singaporean male can expect to live up to about 80, 81 years old. For a female, it's about 84.5. All right. So the question always is, if we are living longer, is that you know, what, what will happen if we outlive our resources? If we do not save enough, and let's say our savings after we retire can only last us up to the age of, let's say, 68 years old, all right? What's going to happen to the remaining years of our lives? Okay, and this is why the government is so concerned today with all these uh, implementations of the shield plan reviews, CPF life schemes, and so on, which we'll talk about in later um, webinars, okay, eventually. The second issue is that we have fewer babies. In Singapore, we are well known, all right? We have the lowest birth rate in this region, and in fact, in most parts of the world. Okay, And with fewer babies, and with the fact that we are all living longer, the question now becomes, as we age and we have fewer babies, who can I depend on when I'm old? You see, our grandparents' uh, generation, we don't have this kind of issue, you know? A person's grandpa uh, grandmother maybe can have eight sons and daughters all right and each of them when she retires giving her a monthly allowance of three hundred dollars will mean that she have about two thousand over dollars in passive income sitting at home doing nothing all right but today we don't have the luxury of it or you know for the matter five kids okay today the normal number of kids a couple will have is about one or two okay so the question is really very true all right when we grow old who can i depend on all right can we depend on our children who themselves may be even suffering, all right, struggling to meet ends meet with the rising cost of uh, living, having to provide for their family, their children. At the same time, do we want to be a burden to them? Okay, so this is another issue, all right. When we grow old, we may not have the people to depend on. Third issue is we must act now, all right. This is a fact. After having so many information from the media, from the government agencies and so on, we all know that we must do something about it. We all know that retirement planning is important. But the question is, what must I do? How can I do it? Okay, and so we go around looking for answers and solutions. All right, so what is the right way to retire securely? How do we do the planning? Okay, the fourth, of course, is the issue of market volatility. Today's economy is not like, you know, the past couple of decades where we know the economic cycle is predictable. We know the average return of S&P over 20 years is this much and that much. All right, today we are talking about, you know, potentially we have a war here, a major credit crisis there in another region of the world. All right, the growth in Asia is diminishing and so on and so forth. So all this affects our investments, which affects our retirement portfolio. So the question is, 
with all this market volatility, how does it affect my retirement? And if it affects my retirement, how then can I manage all this volatility? Okay, so in this context, we talk about portfolio management, investment planning, and things like that. Okay, so in the context of retirement planning, just a simple small context, all right, we can see that financial planning is important because financial planning helps us identify these issues and take steps to manage them. Okay, now let's talk about some myth about financial planning. Okay, um, what is financial planning to other people who are not from the industry? Okay, I know that we are all practitioners, we know what financial planning is, but people may not know that, alright? So financial planning to the rich, it may be unnecessary. Why? I'm so rich, I'm as rich as the bank. Okay, what's there to save? What's there to accumulate? Alright, or I'm so rich, I'm my own insurance company. If I'm sick, I got all the money in the world to pay for my treatment, and so on. So to them, they may think that it's unnecessary, but I think if they think that way, then they are wrong. All right, unfortunately, okay, because I realize that the rich have rich problems, okay, with their estate, with their liquidity, and so on and so forth. Okay, now financial planning to the poor is unaffordable. Okay, why? Today they don't even have money to talk about putting food on the table. Where can they find money to build up for the future? But it is also exactly because they are poor and they cannot afford it. All the more they need financial planning because it also means if they cannot afford put money on the uh, put food on the table. They can also probably unable to afford basic medical care and things like that. So they cannot even be down for the slightest issue. Alright, that's why financial planning is important. And it's a fact that, you know, the poor have the poor way of planning. Alright, there are many cost effective ways of financial planning. And generally in Singapore, alright, it don't cost you a lot to get financial advice. Alright, what is uh the issue is usually the implementation, but there are always low cost manners, alright, that we can do. Okay. Now, to some people, financial planning is so easy that I can DIY do it myself, all right, or do it yourself. Okay, so some people, uh, especially the younger ones, they prefer to go Google on a certain uh, financial planning topic, Google on certain products, and they think that they can buy it. Yeah, to a certain extent, I would agree, all right. If you look at the Fair Review panel, they are allowing uh, consumers today to walk into a branch in a company to just buy direct from the distribution, all right, from the company itself, so that they reduce the cost they pay but I think personally it's not that easy all right that you can DIY everything okay at the end of the day you still need to gather a certain basic level of knowledge in order to understand the nuances in the different aspects of planning all right so for example some people say that oh I can always buy term invest the difference myself question all right what kind of term to buy how much do you need? What kind of structure in a term policy? Are you able to diligently, regularly invest? If you can, what to invest and so on and so forth. All these are real issues and questions that we have to ask ourselves. Okay, so it's not really that easy. Eh? Now, to most people, financial planning basically is you want to sell me something. That's why you talk to me about financial planning. Now, that unfortunately is the stigma of the industry, but I think it's not a bad thing, all right? Uh, because if you can conduct yourself professionally, it also means that you have a market for yourself, okay? So at the end of the day, we must understand there's nothing to be ashamed of about selling, all right? Selling is just basically an exchange of commitment, all right? But what, what is ethics behind it is more important. Are you marketing something, are you sharing something with me with an ethical purpose, you want it for your own personal gains or do you really want to do it because you think with me, alright, the customer first, okay, so to some people, they think financial planning is about you want to sell me something and I think that's also a myth, alright, because not all people are like that, alright, at least I know you are not like that, <laughs> okay, now, Having said that, what are the four responsibilities towards our clients? As a financial planner, I think it's very important, firstly, all right, that we clarify the confusions that our clients may have. Okay, today in the industry, there are many confusions or many things that can cause confusions. For example, we have so many products in the market. We have in the past only basic endowment and whole life insurance and some term insurance. But today we have whole life insurance, we have term insurance, we have universal life insurance, we have private placement life insurances, we have ILPs, we have all these funny investments, even structured products, which in the past are just open to private banking clients. But today, you know, uh, your your guy next door kind of a uh, client, all right. The retail investors they can also access to structured products, which is why today you have to also um, get your M8A, M9A qualified. 
okay, because all these things are accessible to them. All right. So really, the market has been um, evolving a lot, and as a result, there are many products in the market. Okay, so even in terms of investment products, all right, in the past we only had very basic uh, investments um, funds, for example, unit trust. But as an uh, as we go on, all right, today we see many uh, more different types of investment structures. For example, in the past, structured products, like I mentioned earlier, are only open and accessible to private banking clients, and then eventually it became the AIs who have access. And then recently, in recent years, all right, even your retail investors have access to it. All right, talk about bonds. All right, in the past, you know, to buy bonds, you need a very big lot size. All right, uh, without two hundred thousand dollars on hand, you cannot basically invest in bonds. But today, you have retail bonds, and most recently, seasoned bonds can also be broken down into parts and sold to retail investors. So we are seeing a lot of all this uh, evolution of investment products. Okay, not to mention you have your leverage products like your forex, uh, CFDs, and all these things. Okay, which a lot of people are attracted to. Okay, but the question is, do you understand the underlying risk, and do you know how to manage your finances? All right, in terms of your trading, trade management. Okay, so a financial planner firstly have the responsibility of clarifying the confusion the clients may have. Okay, that means playing a mentoring role. All right, in cl clarifying different um, doubts and questions they have. Okay, that also means that you must have the proper knowledge. Okay, the second responsibility is to address key areas of need in our clients' um, life. Okay, if we know that the client has a particular issue with under insurance, he may be the only breadwinner in the family, and he thinks that he don't need insurance. I think that's a main, uh, that's a very significant problem. Okay, what happens if something happens to him, like a premature death or disability? Okay, so we need to help our clients address the key areas of their needs. All right, how to manage their cash flow, how to help them to spend less, save more. You know, very basic things like that. Okay. The third responsibility we have is to recommend suitable solutions to our client. All right, one of the complaints in the industry in the past is that many of them have been sold. All right, uh, they are sold something that they don't need, something that they don't want, something that they don't even know what they bought. Okay, so as a financial planner, I think we have responsibilities to recommend the most suitable solutions to our client. Suitable solutions means it meets their need. All right, firstly, it meets their needs. Secondly, it must be cost efficient to them, and thirdly, it must be realistic. All right, something that they can sustain over the long term. Otherwise, they're going to suffer again financially. All right. Now, the fourth responsibility we have toward our client is to educate the client about financial planning. I think uh, we have done well as an industry in this aspect. All right. Today, we are seeing more and more uh, seminar, free talks given by financial institutions, individuals, and so on. Even myself today, I'm here talking to you in a webinar, which in the past I wouldn't do except for my private um students. Okay, so we really have a responsibility toward um, educating our client about different aspects of financial planning. So to sum it all up, we have four responsibilities. Clarify the confusion, address the key area of needs, recommend suitable solutions, and educate the client about financial planning. So C-A-R-E. We need to care for our clients. Ah, okay, yeah, this one you must remember. All right. So... After having said all this, all right, going through the meat and the responsibilities, what really is financial planning? Okay, personally, in my own opinion, financial planning is firstly a process. All right, it is a process of uh, managing your client's wealth, dealing with their issues, and so on. All right, and this process begins with a discovery of their information. All right, uh, understanding the client's needs, okay, what they want to achieve, their goals, helping them to crystallize their desires, their financial goals, and so on. All right, collecting sufficient information, all right, to process and analysis, all right, identifying the strengths, the weaknesses, the potential opportunities and threats that they may have, and then developing strategies to meet their financial objectives and oversee the implementation process. Okay, and finally, with that, all right, implementation, we have the outcome where the client can turn their dreams into reality, they can increase their net worth, they will see that they are becoming richer and richer, they are getting lesser and lesser debt. And so on and so forth. All right, all this because of financial planning. All right, so it starts as a process. Then you go into the discovery, the analysis, the developmental phase of the strategy, implement it, and then getting the proper outcome. All right. So in a nutshell, this is financial planning. Okay. If I can put it simply into three simple points, financial planning is about firstly looking at what you have done in the past. All right. Understand the past. And then you determine what the client have today in the present. What are the available resources, available budget, and so on. And thirdly, understanding what they want to achieve in the future. And then taking the past and the present, 
develop a strategy all right to achieve what they want to achieve in the future okay financial planning all right so having said the process of financial planning who really is a financial planner okay so a financial planning uh, so a financial planner or certified financial planner for that matter is firstly a globally recognized certification mark okay the CFP designation is globally recognized and what it means to you is that this is a brand all right secondly a certified financial planner a CFP is a professional that means he has the adequate knowledge and the competence to manage your wealth all right thirdly a certified financial planner uses a systematic approach of financial planning and that means you have quality assurance and control because everybody follows a system of practice a systematic approach and finally a certified financial planner is bound to a strict code of ethics and professional conduct and with that all right that uh, put us in the field and the level of a professional and that means that our clients can trust us as we take on the fiduciary duties toward our clients okay so branding competence quality and trust all right this is what I do always in my lessons all right I summarize and concise everything into uh, main key points and uh, words okay now with understanding what a CFP is or who a CFP is let's talk about branding of practice I want to ask all of us here a question all right uh, I'm assuming that all of you here attending this webinar session today is a practitioner in the industry all right so I would like to ask you what is your personal branding or your mission Okay, when a person sees you, all right, and then they ask you, what do you do? What is your answer to them? Oh, is it going to be, I'm an insurance agent? Is it going to be, I'm a financial advisor? Is it going to be, I'm a financial consultant? I'm a financial planner, whatsoever. Okay, if your answers are all these, these are correct answers, all right, because this defines your profession. Okay, but I think in terms of branding, you can spruce it up a little bit to make it a little bit more catchy. You know, at the end of the day, branding means you've got to ask yourself, what makes you different from your competitors? And in our industry, your competitor need not be the opposing company, all right? Need not be the other bank that you are competing against. It could, in fact, be the very next colleague sitting next to you, looking at the same webinar today, all right? Just imagine this: you and your friend grew up together in secondary school, all the way to university. You graduated. All of you joined the same company, all right? And then end up in the same agency. And then you know the same classmate who is very rich today, who is looking for financial advice, and he's stuck with a choice between you and your friend. Who should you choose? Uh, who should he choose? And the next question is, why should he even choose you? Okay, so what will cause him or her to decide to do business with you instead of the other competitor? Okay, and that is basically branding. Okay. Now. My personal branding is all about this simple tagline, all right? Creating wealth, preserving dignity, changing lives, turning dreams into reality. So everywhere I go, when people ask me what I do, I tell them this, all right? Creating wealth, preserving dignity, changing lives, turning dreams into reality. That becomes my personal power phrase. Okay, I hope all of us here, we are able to um, have our own personal branding, all right? It could be a power phrase, it could be a set of um, ideals or core values that you adapt to and you are strictly adhere to, all right? So why is this important? Just imagine this, all right? You step into a very crowded lift, okay, in a somewhere in a luxurious tower, for example, Suntec City. Okay, it's very crowded. You are there to see a particular client for an appointment, right? You step into the lift. Everybody is squeezing one another, and then when you are in the lift, you look up and lo and lo and behold, you saw your friend whom you have not met for twenty years, and today he happens to be the CEO of a particular MNC situated in that particular office. Okay, and it says, hey, Ronald, long time no see, how are you? Hey, long time no see. So, Ronald, what do you do now? All right, what are you going to say? Oh, I'm an insurance agent. I'm a financial planner. Yeah, these are, again, like I said, good answers, but are they uh, helping you, all right, in terms of branding? Okay, so if you have a tagline like that, all right, if they ask me, hey, Ronald, what are you doing? Hey, I'm in the business of creating wealth, preserving dignity, and changing lives, helping my clients turn their dreams into reality. Okay, what do you think they'll react? they probably go, oh, what's that? Okay, and that gives you the opportunity, all right, to say, well, long story, but do you have time, like half an hour during tea break, about three o'clock, can I meet you for coffee? I tell you more about what I do, and so on, and what you have is an appointment for your friend, all right? So I think it's important, uh, 
to set yourself apart. Okay, at the end of the day, jokes aside, all right, personal branding is important because it builds the credibility and that branding, all right, and why the client must choose you. Now let's talk about the industry-wide changes. Okay, uh, why is the why is getting the CFP mark important? Okay, one of the reasons is also because we have a lot of um, changes in the industry right now undergoing, and the main one is fair. All right, the financial advisory industry review. At the end of the day, is fair fair or not? <laughs> is the question that many uh, practitioners are asking today. Is it really fair to me? Okay, now let's look at what is the purpose of fair. Okay, according to a speech by Mr. Lee Chuan Tik, uh, uh, the then um, deputy director of MAS. Okay, in the Market for Financial Advice Symposium in uh, 6th of July 2012, he says that the role of financial advisors is not merely to sell products. Okay, and really there are two purpose or two key roles uh, through advisory. Firstly, he says that it is to impart basic financial planning skills to clients, and secondly, to help them understand the products that they invest in. Okay, so these are the two key roles that advisory can achieve. Okay, and there are two critical challenges to be addressed in that speech that he said. Okay, firstly, Singaporeans are underinsured, and secondly, we have a retirement planning deficiency. Okay, and through all this, okay, we also want to be able to improve regulation to increase the level of professionalism and to protect consumers okay, from all these myriads of um, investment products and uh, issues. Okay, so if we summarize all these things. We understand that firstly, the purpose of FAIR is to create a role change in the practitioners. So today we are no longer salespeople. We should no longer be known as salespeople. We should be consultants, all right, professionals in a sense. All right, so that's a role change. The second key role is in the areas of need. All right, uh, there is a need to impart financial planning skills to our client, and there's also a need to help them understand the products they invest in. So if you remember what I mentioned earlier about our four responsibilities, C-A-R-E, Okay, it basically deals with these two key roles. And then, to sum it up, there are two critical challenges to be addressed. Uh, okay, and this is also a representation of the areas of opportunities that you can uh, explore all right, in uh, developing and growing your business. At the end of the day, right, okay, what this fair purpose to achieve right, is professionalism. And through professionalism, through better practices, through uh, the key roles being addressed, what you actually build for yourself Right, it's not just branding, but also an increased entry barrier and credibility. Okay, that means uh, when you have the proper knowledge, the proper skills, and you adopt the proper method of doing things, okay, a competitor is very difficult to come in and take the client away from you. Okay, which today in the market is pretty common, all right, because the industry is so competitive in these days. Okay, so how do you keep your client's loyalty toward you? Okay, it's a challenge as well. Now there are five key areas that um, FAIR wants to address, Okay, um, you can read it up for yourself, but at the end of the day, the takeaway is this, we must increase our level of competence and no longer see ourselves as salespeople running after targets, after targets, after targets every year. Okay, We have a unique and significant role to play in the financial planning industry in Singapore. And the Certified Financial Planner Certification will basically equip you with the competence and the branding to compete effectively in today's competitive environment. So if you want to be successful and uh, you know grow your business, okay, the CFP is one avenue you can pursue in terms of upgrading yourself. Okay. So what's the value of the CFP certification? How can it help to add value to your practice? Okay. So let me talk about the mark now, the CFP mark. Okay. Now to give you some history, the CFP designation was a internationally recognized certification since 1972. Okay, it's not the earliest, all right. In fact, the earliest was a uh, Chartered Life Underwriter CLU, okay, in the uh, 1920s. Okay, in 1972, okay, the CFP mark was officially um, created, all right, and this is an internationally recognized mark since 72. Okay, uh, the CFP program, all right, um, focuses a lot on the relevance and the practicality. So you don't just learn theory, okay, but you learn how to apply the theory into your practice, and as a result, it has been a highly sought after destination. Today, this mark is recognized internationally, known globally, all right, and we have more than 150,000 um, CFP practitioners all around the world. Okay, in fact, uh, in my office, you can ask my staff, we do have overseas people deployed to Singapore. They are in uh, key management positions in MNCs. Okay, when they came over, they call us up because they realize that we are the one providing a CFP education and they ask, can you recommend a CFP 
to me to help me uh, manage my wealth. Okay, you can ask my staff. They call and they ask for this. Okay, but unfortunately, they called the wrong organization. They should have been calling FIPAS, all right, the Financial Planning Association of Singapore. Okay, which we eventually directed them there. Okay, but anyway, the point I want to drive at is this is an internationally recognized certification, all right. And the good thing is that it's not linked to any sub industry and it's internationally mobile. Okay, that means to say, if you're CFP in Singapore, you can go to Malaysia to practice as a recognized certified financial planner. Or you can go to even Australia, United Kingdom, all right. Um, but what you need to do is to pass a challenge paper there. Okay, usually it's related to the law of the land, all right. So at the end of the day, the CFP is the gold standard in financial planning. Okay, it's a internationally recognized destination. Okay, so it's something that you should consider pursuing, all right. Now let's talk about the direct value add to you. Okay, why do you? Why should you pursue the CFP destination? Firstly, like I mentioned earlier, it is a mark of trust and competence okay, in, to your clients. All right, a CFP rec, uh, represents four things. All right, you have gone through the proper education. Okay, you have passed the stringent examination requirement. You have the proper experience and you adhere to a code of ethics and professional practices. And because of that, your client who sees you, all right, who sees your destination CFP after your name on your name card, all right, will have more um, trust in you, all right? Implied trust. Okay, at the end of the day, remember our prospect or client have only 10 to 20 seconds to assess whether to do business with you or not. Okay, so if they don't know you, they have to trust the mark that you carry, all right? The second value add is branding. Like I mentioned earlier, okay, the CFP mark is an internationally um, recognized destination, okay, and it sets you apart from um, your competitors, all right? Thirdly, it's a management requirement in um, certain um, financial in, uh, institutions. Okay, today some of the companies require you to have at least the associate financial planner AFP, all right, to move up to uh, management and to be a full CFP to be a director. Okay, in certain companies, it represents increased income. Okay, the reason is simple because you are CFP, you are recognized, all right. Uh, the retail investors wouldn't just be the people you should be uh, going after or pursuing. Okay, but in uh, in fact, all right, the high net worth, the C floor, the management level people, the affluent clans will also be relevant, and they will want to seek your advice. And as a result, you have increased income. Okay. And lastly, it allows you to assess niche market. Okay, like I mentioned earlier, all right, you can have access to the ultra affluent, all right, uh, people like um, high net worth clients, business owners, and so on. Okay, and these are pretty niche markets because um, at their level, all right, they are not, uh, they don't have a lot of time, but they need very sophisticated um, planning needs, all right, and strategies. So with the CFP mark, at least you represent the capability and competence uh, to advise them. Okay, and in fact, in a lot of um, high net worth clients' portfolio, the CFP acts as a team leader because we are known as a generalist in, in general. Right, the investment specialists they are very good with investments, all right. They are good with numbers and so on, but they may not be as well crafted in terms of engaging a client. Alright, a CFP is everything wrapped up into one. Okay, so they act uh, as a very strong role in terms of a team leader in a portfolio of our clients' needs. Alright. Now, why CFP? Okay, these are some survey results. Huh? Okay, I, I don't want to go through too much, but firstly, the result outcome says CFP professionals are more productive and profitable. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Okay. The second says CFP professionals results in satisfied clients and CFP professionals make great employees. Yahoo! <laughs> okay, anyway, now this is for you to read up. Okay, um, these are survey done by FPSB. Yeah? All right. Now, three more good reasons to pursue the CFP certification. 75% of the CFP professionals say that CFP certification is a major catalyst for their career success. Okay, so it really builds their career. Okay, th by the way, this is a survey by the CFP Board of Standards a couple of years ago. Okay, they say that CFPs, all right, average earnings increase of 31%, and clients who use CFP professionals likely refer their friends. I think in Singapore, this is a challenge we have in terms of generating um, referrals. Okay, so this is something that you can consider. <coughs> All right, now let me give you an overview of the um, landscape in Singapore about the CFP. Okay, you can see that um, worldwide, 
there are a total of 157,586 practitioners as of December 2014 and they are growing at a rate of 2.7% every year. Okay, what I want to bring you to attention is in Singapore. All right, we currently have 908 CFP professionals in Singapore. Uh, what that means to you is basically a niche certification to hold. All right, in fact, in Singapore, we have a practitioner base of about 30,000 people. I'm not sure the latest number, but it should be around there. And you represent one of the 908 if you're a CFP practitioner here today. All right. So it means you have a very niche um, destination. Okay. So again, it's something that you can consider. What about the journey to the CFP certification? Okay. In terms of the CFP course, okay, to get the destination, you have to clear six modules of examination in all. All right, and you can do it uh, in a minimal sp uh, time frame of about one year. Okay. Basically, you should start with module one. Okay. Module one is the foundation module all right is also known as the uh, AFP module all right why because when you pass the module 1 examination you will be awarded the associate financial planner designation the AFP designation okay you can move on to pass modules 4 and 5 all right um and after passing modules 1 4 and 5 you'll be awarded the associate wealth planner the AWP designation then you move on to pass modules 2 and 3 and finally pass your Module 6 to get your full certif uh, Certified Financial Planner designation, the CFP. All right. Now, you can do up to three examinations in one exam settings, and they're all together three exam settings in a year. So what you can do, if you want to finish everything within one year, all right, is to finish Module 1, 4, 5 in one exam setting. Okay. You probably find that a challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge, but it's a very interesting challenge. All right. In the second exam setting, you take Modules 2 and 3 and pass them on the first attempt. And then on the third exam intake, you finish module six to get your full CFP destination in one year. I did that, okay, and I got my CFP in one year. Okay, it's not impossible. All right, um, it just means that you have to put some focus and effort into your studies. All right, get over and done with. Okay. So altogether, the CFP course have six uh, modules. Module one is the foundation in financial planning. This is where you learn everything you need to know about financial planning. All right, what happens in this module? is that we go very broad based but very um, surface we do not touch too much in depth because of the scope of the things that we need to cover okay and then subsequently in modules 2 to 6 all right we will go more narrow in scope but deeper in depth all right so module 2 is a specialization module on risk management and insurance so if you want to know more about uh, risk management planning related techniques and um, strategies all right this is the module to go to Okay, module 3 talks about tax and estate planning. Module 4, investment planning. This is where you also learn about different types of investment products and strategies. Module 5 talks about retirement planning. And module 6 is where you put everything you learn in module 1 to 5 okay, into constructing a financial plan in module 6. All right. So altogether, 6 modules. <laughs> now, to give you an overview of what to expect in module 1, okay, in module 1, with financial perspectives, we have altogether 16 chapters. All right, uh, and our scope of education is in line with the examination syllabus in uh, Financial Planning Association of Singapore. So we start um, chapter one with the financial planning process. Okay, this is where you learn uh, how to do financial planning, why financial planning, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then chapter two and three, we talk about cash flow management. This is where you learn how to analyze the financial health of the client, and then from there, recommend the proper um, strategies to help them manage their finances better. So things like budgeting, debt management, and so on. Okay. Now, we then go on to investment planning, which is basically chapters 4 all the way down to chapter 9. And this is where you learn about time value of money, investment concepts, you learn about the different instruments. So we started with uh, valuation methods. Okay, So you will learn the Warren Buffett method of value investing, you will learn about technical analysis, you will learn about um, equities, preferred stocks, bonds, structured products, derivatives, meaning your options, forward swaps, futures, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then we cover also unit trust as well. Okay, and then chapter 10 and 11 talks about retirement planning. Chapter 10 talks about the strategies for retirement planning, how to calculate retirement needs, what's the framework, what's the system. Okay, chapter 11 is an entire chapter on CPF. All right, and CPF is a headache today because there are so many changes to it. Okay, but if you want to know more about CPF, I think this is a good chapter to um, follow. 
All right. Then chapter 12 and 13 talks about risk management planning. Chapter 12 talks about the principles of risk management. What are the theories? All right. And then chapter 7 gives you the uh, chapter 13 gives you the different types of um, insurance products and overview of them. Okay. Whole life insurance, term, ILPs, annuities, structured products, and so on. Okay. And then um, chapter 15, all right, talks about tax and estate planning. And finally, in chapter 16, it talks about ethics and professional practice standards. Okay, so altogether, 16 chapters, it should give you a very good overview and a foundational understanding of financial planning. And the good thing about this module is that even if you are not an industry practitioner, you are just a person who's not from the industry, but you want to learn more about financial planning, how to learn, how to get a basic overview to do it yourself and to understand the process better to talk to your uh, financial planners. Okay, I think this is a good module to pursue as well. All right. <coughs> now, after saying so much about the course, now let's talk about the education provider. Now specifically, why should you choose financial perspectives? Okay. And one of the key reasons I can tell you is that we have 16 years of proven track record. Okay, uh, although I just bought over the business last September, but I've been a trainer with FP for the past six years. Okay, and I've seen how um, many students we have trained. I personally have trained hundreds of them already. So, to give you some brief overview about financial pr perspectives, okay, we are the first CFP education provider in Singapore. And this company was started since 1999. That was also when the CFP mark was brought into Singapore and the Financial Planning Association of Singapore was started. Okay, currently, we are the market leader in training CFP professionals and the lectures are conducted by experienced team of CFP professionals. Myself is one of them. Okay, we have also other industry leaders who are the trainers for this um, program with us. All right, and one of the unique things I need to talk about is our materials. All right, um, in financial perspectives, we are the only EP with our own um, in-house um, study materials. Okay, so it adds as an additional boost for your education. And our materials are adapted from the US College of Financial Planning. So we bought over the license, we adapted it, we localized it into Singapore context. So instead of seeing your American 401k and things like this, the tax laws, you will see it localized in terms of our CPF framework, IRAS, you know, and things like this. So everything you learn is relevant to your country, all right, is relevant to your practice and understanding. Okay. So why choose financial perspectives? Okay, firstly, we have very excellent online student support and Q&A. Students who are with me will know that, you know, I have given them my email address, my Skype ID, my handphone number. So from all these channels, they can WhatsApp me, they can email me, ask me questions throughout the entire module. All right, and even after that, okay, I do respond to the emails and queries within one working day. Okay, sometimes no later than three days, all right? We provide very exam-focused summaries. Okay, um, besides the slides that we give away, all right. Um, in class we also give away some mind maps and notes. All right, and different lecturers have different styles. Okay, some will draw mind maps, some will give you summaries, and so on. Okay, by the end of the day, you need to understand you will not be left alone there. Okay, we have experienced lecturers, and we integrate theory with practice. I think that is very important if you're a practitioner, you want to know how to apply the theory. And nobody else can do it, all right, except people who have done it themselves. Okay, so that's why we need experienced lecturers. And in financial perspectives, we have trainers who are CFPs themselves in the industry. Okay, so we can help you to understand the theory better and put them into practice. Okay, we also have flexible study options. Now, in financial perspectives, we have an uh, option of um, evening class, all right, part time. Um, lecture-based studies where you come to um, our classrooms in SMU, attend a lecture once a week or twice a week, and then for a couple of sessions, do your revision and then go for the exam. Or you can go for self-study option, whereby you come to our company, or in our office in um, Peace Center right now, sign your registration, all right, and then collect the materials you're on your own. Okay. Now, we also have updated and student-friendly materials. Uh, I personally made it a point right now, since I took over the company, to make sure that every module is updated in every exam intake. Okay, It may not be relevant to your examination because of the six months rule, but nevertheless, I will make sure that um, all these things, the latest changes and updates are updated and given a mention all right, in the lectures and some addendums that I'm going to give. Okay. So what's the study options available? Like I mentioned earlier, all right, you can choose a classroom lecture option. Okay, and today if you are on the classroom lecture option, 
okay, you qualify for the WDA fund. Uh, we have a 90% funding right now for industry practitioners. All you need to do is clock 75% attendance in your class, attempt the examination okay, to qualify for the funding. Okay, to know more details about the funding, please contact my staff in the company. All right. The other option is, of course, self-study, where you collect the materials and then study on your own. Okay, these are more for busy people or people who have sufficient experience and they think they don't need to um, spend too much time in class and you think you can manage studying on your own. Well, you can go ahead with self-study option, but remember, for self-study option, there's no funding. Okay, so that's the main difference. Huh? So that brings me to the end of my um, webinar. I want to thank you for your time and attention today. All right, if there's any questions that you want to ask, please contact uh, our company directly through the email given here. Okay, or you may call our office directly or visit our website. Okay, I've updated my website. So right now, a lot of information are updated. All right, so thank you for your time today and I hope to see you in class soon.